My name's Colin Marshall. This is the Marketplace of Ideas. My guest is essayist, novelist, and poet Philip Lopate. His writing has been highly influential for the form known today as creative nonfiction, and his personal essays have been most recently collected into the book Getting Personal. Philip, welcome to the Marketplace of Ideas. Glad to be here. Now, I just brought you on as an essayist, novelist, and poet. And, I mean, you could also be called a film writer. Your film writing has been included with Criterion DVDs. That's how good you are. But how do you categorize yourself in your own mind? Forget what anybody else thinks. Well, I do think I'm... Uh, mostly an essayist. In a way, I think of myself as a storyteller. I'm telling stories in my essays as well as in my fiction. The common thread is that you're telling a story no matter what you're doing? Yes, and sometimes in the essays, I'm telling the story of how I think about something. That's the plot. Could you describe your own brand of personal essay? Because it's the form most commonly associated with you. What makes a Philip Lopate personal essay? I try for honesty and humor, and to dig deeper. So certainly uh, candor is part of it. I also am trying for a kind of a worldly irony based on um, not being naive, disenchantment in a kind of positive sense, you might say. And I also uh, place a high value on retrospection that is looking backward and trying to figure out what you make of experience, not just reporting experience, but figuring it out somehow, analyzing it. Of the qualities that you list there, which is the hardest to achieve? Is it humor, honesty, candor? What's the, what was the toughest one to, to master of all those? Honesty is something that I'm always looking for, but we can fool ourselves so easily. We can deceive ourselves. We can be defensive. I try to be honest, but I'm aware always of a tendency to rationalize, to put myself in the best light. And so that's something that always has to be guarded against, self-righteousness, defensiveness, and so on. But it's inevitable. I don't think you can ever cure yourself of it. You can try not to make yourself look good then, but it's not always possible. You're always going to have that tendency? Yes. And in fact, sometimes by trying to make yourself not look good, you're, you're letting yourself off the hook by saying, see... Even I know. <laughs> Has it been the case where you've, you've just found yourself trying to make yourself look too flawed while you're writing, writing an essay and it just becomes unrealistic? or is that not I, a try to, I try to, to be balanced. And, and one of the hardest things to do in personal essays is to give an accurate assessment of your strengths as well as your weaknesses because it's distorting to pretend that, you, that you're totally inept if you're not. So somehow you have to, to tip the reader off to, to your assets as well as your liabilities without seeming to be bragging or without seeming to, to um, crow too much. It's getting to the truth about yourself, and that's the primary challenge then. Yes, exactly. It's a curiosity about yourself, not, not smugness and not self-dislike. Since you've become so associated with the personal essay, I wanted to ask what you thought on this. Do you think that you are better at the personal essay than every other form you've tried, or it's just more what audiences respond to from you? No, I think I, I, think I am better. But for instance, um, I just finished a, a novella which has a slightly wacky first-person narrator. And so I'm conscious of, of, of using the personal essay voice in, in a fictional way by distorting a little bit by making the narrator a little bit more unreliable, let's say. So it's become a base for me to operate out of in lots of different ways. And, and when I wrote poetry, uh, again, I was trying to, to write a poetry of, um, of honesty, humor, and vulnerability. Now, the essayist voice, the novelist voice, the poet voice, the film writer voice, are these difficult to keep separate when you're writing any one thing, or are they... Four flavors of the same thing. I think there's a lot of continuity. So, for instance, when I write film criticism, to me it's still an essay, and I'm trying to create a kind of literary sparkle. I'm trying to create a texture so that the writing 
old somehow. You know, it won't it won't seem too glib or won't be too slangy. It will have a kind of um, inner consistency and a kind of vocabulary that snares the reader. Uh, so I do think, in a way, that it's all the same baloney. You know, but you slice it differently. <laughs> In what order did you take on these forms? What were you first, and how did you add on to that with time? I think I was first a fiction writer. And I don't think many um, adolescents fantasize becoming essayists, you know? That, yeah, it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, the heroic forms are fiction and poetry. And I wanted to be a fiction writer and wrote stories and novels. And then my life got very complicated and difficult. And I began writing poetry because I needed to write more on the fly. For several years, I was a poet. And then, at last, I came to the personal essay. And it seemed to me that the personal essay was a way of combining poetry and fiction. That is, I could take from poetry that associative leaping quality where you can make sudden transitions, you know. You don't have to um, build the arc quite so much the way you do in a short story. But still there was a through line. There was a kind of plot. So personal essays became for me the fusion of poetry and fiction with something else, the essayistic. It's a road you had to take where you had to move through fiction and poetry before you could you could competently do your own style of personal essay. Yes, and, and, and also I had to get older because it may be unfair of me to say this, but I do think that the personal essay tends to be a form that young people are not as well equipped for because it requires a certain amount of experience and reflection on experience. In poetry, you know, you can be quite young, of course. You can be a lyric poet. And, uh, and many great poets started when they were in their teens and even earlier. But I think that in essays, you need to have had things happen to you for the ceiling to have fallen on your head a few times to begin to put things in perspective. Because I think that the personal essay is not an apocalyptic voice, but it's a voice of, of everyday life in perspective. How long did you find you had to spend on this earth before you could claim to have the experience needed to write these personal essays? For me, I guess it was um, in my 30s that I began. And I wrote a book called Being with Children, which was about my experiences teaching kids. I found, in a way, that I was writing a collection of essays, taking different themes. In other words, it was a kind of unconscious collection of personal essays, which I only realized afterwards when I began, really later on in my 30s, to read a lot of, of the great masters of the essay form and to realize that this was a form that had been lying in wait for me all my life. And who were the great masters of the form that you discovered? I think uh, the first essayist I fell in love with was William Hazlitt, the 19th century English essayist. And Hazlitt's great friend was Charles Lamb. So I read Hazlitt and Lamb, who always seemed to go together like ham and eggs. <laughs> and, and then they um, brought me to Montaigne, who everyone talked about. Emerson wrote an essay about Montaigne, and, and Hazlitt wrote an essay about Montaigne. I read and reread Montaigne, and then I read um, Orwell, of course, and Virginia Woolf, and James Baldwin, and eventually uh, edited this book called The Art of the Personal Essay, which attempted to assert uh, the canon of the personal essay. Now, when you edited that book, were you looking for a variety of examples of the different kinds of thing a personal essay can be, or were you looking for the best examples of not maybe not a platonic ideal of the personal essay, but the ones that come closest to the ideal personal essay, as in like a singular ideal? I think I was looking for variety. There are lots of different forms in it. There are personal essays that are essentially memoir pieces. There are personal essays that are ruminations on a topic. There are personal essays that are kind of lists, like uh, Say Shanigan's, um Hateful Things. There's one by Natalia Ginsburg called He and I, which is essentially a kind of verbal ping-pong about her and her husband. So I was looking for a variety, and I read far and wide. I even read in some cultures where I couldn't really find many personal essays. For instance, uh, Native American or Arab writers, where there didn't seem to be much of a tradition of the personal essay. 
So I really tried to cover all bases. I read Chinese and Japanese. And I was looking not just for the Anglo-American or European model, but for this tendency as it cropped up all over the world. When you talk about the, the varying presence of personal essays in other cultures, does the personal essay have the most popularity in the Western English-speaking world then? Montaigne is the greatest personal essayist, and he was French. Yeah, yeah. But a curious thing happened, which was that from Montaigne, it really took flower in England. And, uh, and after England, I think uh, America was very important. But there was also a continental tradition uh, of the essay, a more philosophical essay that people like uh, Walter Benjamin and Roland Barthes and E.M. Shuren got into. And so I wanted some examples of that as well. You yourself have written an essay called What Happened to the Personal Essay? So I guess that's a question I'll put to you. What happened to the personal essay? I think that um, it was very popular in the 19th and early 20th century. And then it kind of um, went into decline and then went through a resurgence again. I think there was a period when it it was seen as kind of um, too whimsical or too defanged, you might say. But then there were always personal essays that, that came about through a passion or something very topical, like James Baldwin's essays on racial matters or Orwell's about the laboring classes, or Virginia Woolf's uh, Room of, of One's Own, or Three Guineas. Uh, Norman Mailer wrote this essay, uh, The Prison of Sex. And, and, and we didn't think of them as personal essays because they came about with such urgency that they just seemed to arise from, from topical pressures. Uh, but, they, they, um, but they were personal essays because there's something indomitable about the impulse of people to give shape to their experiences. That topical urgency is not something that you see today? I think you still, you still see it. In fact, a lot of personal essays show up in books that seem to be about a theme, you know. Like, for instance, someone will write about addiction to alcoholism, or someone will write about addiction to sex, let's say, or about um, coping with being disabled. And... We don't always think of them as personal essays, but essentially they are ruminations on experience. The topical handle distorts that, that genesis in a way. Now, you mentioned your book, Being with Children, and I wanted uh, to bring up that book, actually. This was, as you said, an accidental collection of personal essays. You didn't know you were writing personal essays at the time? I was writing a book about my teaching experiences. And, of course, I had to divide it up into chapters. And I wanted it to be lively, and I wanted it to be funny at times, and to be a kind of questionable account by a, a complex human being of my encounters with the kids and teachers at this particular school. What I later came to realize is that these chapters are really shaped personal essays. That was an important book for me. I had to make myself into a character, and it's always a problem when people write about teaching because you don't want to heroize yourself too much, but you want to give some, some hope, you want to give some account. And I think education is a fascinating subject. It's so complicated uh, how to describe what happens in the classroom at any one moment. And th there was this whole tradition of books about teaching, like Herbert Cole's 36 Children, Jonathan Kozel's Death in an Early Age, John Holt's How Children Fail. Sylvia Ashton Warner's teacher, and I wanted to be part of that tradition of personal accounts of teaching. You mentioned not heroizing yourself, and I imagine when writing a book about teaching, there are a huge number of cliches that you want to avoid. Of course, the hero teacher being one of them, but also, for example, the, the, the wise children who, who know more than the adults in all instances. You, yes, yes. You, were you trying to avoid these consciously, like you had them in your mind as things you did not want to put down on paper? Yes, like for instance... You know, they always say, I learned more from my students than they learned from me. <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that. Another thing was that there was this kind of cliche going around at the time that children were natural poets. What I discovered in working with them was that there was probably the same percentage of talent among children as there were among adults. That is, they were very gifted child poets. There were kids who had very little imagination. Uh, <laughs> You know, there were ones who just were coping or trying to do it because it was an assignment, you know. So I didn't think that children were, 
were natural poets uh, until it was beaten out of them. I thought that, you know, you know, some are meant to be poets and some are not. And for those who haven't read the book, could you describe a little bit about the nature of your position at the school, the, the writer in the school thing that was going on? Yes, I came in as a writer in the schools, and I was supposed to spark some interest in uh, developing a creative writing curriculum, and I was also training other writers and artists. What happened was that um, I started getting more and more involved in the life of the school so that it was less important, let's say, to come up with new curriculum ideas and more important to go with the energy of the kids. Some kids, I discovered, were not very interested in writing poetry or fiction, but were interested in being in plays or making their own movies. So I ended up uh, following their energy, and uh, we made movies. We, we put on uh, West Side Story and Uncle Vanya. Uh, we, we started our own comic book club. We started a radio station, and, and what I was really trying to see was how, uh, how you follow out a line of energy in a way. And I was trying to get kids to, to go through a process and to complete it. I don't know if you remember this, but in those days there was this kind of progressive slogan, process, not product. Well, I believed in process and product. That is, I wanted them to go through the process, but I wanted them to stick to it until they could complete it. You mentioned putting on Uncle Vanya, and it's one of the best-known, I think, essays from that book of yours. And people read it, and they wonder how such a Herculean task of putting on Chekhov with kids this young was actually done. Was that a matter of of writing pre-existing energy for you, like you said? Not entirely. Uh, I had been teaching, teaching in that school for years. I wanted to do something that interested me, you know? Uh, I'd been making their vampire movies with them, you know, in their nightclub films and, and, and all the things that they wanted to do. And I was kind of fascinated with Uncle Vanya, and it began as a series of writing exercises. And then I thought, maybe there's some connection between Chekhov and children. That is, in the boredom, in the waiting for life to begin, and so on. And also, I love the idea of working on a large project, because it, it does liberate energies uh, that you can't always get to in the very chopped up school day. But one thing, they had to memorize a lot. So the chance for failure was increased. But also, uh, the involvement was that much greater. Because, you know, they, it was such a big task. At the time, you described in the book that you weren't thinking about writing this up while you were doing it. So when did you come back to the material to write it up? How long was it afterward? In the case of Uncle Vanya, um, I did it, and then I went away on vacation, and I began to to see the uh, these Jacobian moments in my own life of uh, you know being at a loss, being in leisure, not quite knowing what to make of things. I guess I am somebody who does not vacation well. I don't know what to do to them with myself a lot of times. I'm a bit of a workaholic, and for me, one of the greatest pleasures is in writing. So a few months after I had finished the project, it began to take shape in my mind uh, as a narrative, and I began to want to write about it. Uh, and I was working for Teachers and Writers Collaborative, which is an organization that sent writers into the schools, and they had a magazine, and, and I knew that if I, if I wrote it, they would publish it in their magazine. So, you know, this was always the, the challenge to go through something and then see if you could make it into a narrative on the page. Earlier we talked about so the personal essay as being what you might call an adult format, written by people who have years behind them. And what does writing about little kids trying to get into their heads as well, how does that complicate the situation? Kids sometimes have this, um, this incredible, um, almost cartoon-like spark to them, you know. They give you a lot of drama. <laughs> they carry on, they rant, they rave, you know. Everything is so important to them. The tears fall so quickly. I think that, that, that there's a, a childish side to myself, you know, that I identified with them. In fact, sometimes after I published Being with Children, people would come uh, to visit the school to see me operating, and they, they, they would think, they would expect to see this person who was very noble and saintly, and they would be surprised at me yelling <laughs> at the kids, you know. Well, the kids made noise, I yelled at them, they yelled at me, you know, and we all inspire each other to be a little more childish together. 
if I'm correct in the timeline here, and correct me if I'm wrong, you had you published Being with Children, and you were still teaching after That's that right. was published. What did the press from that book, what did that cause as far as, you know, when you were still teaching and you were known as a writing teacher who would publish this book about teaching? What did that bring to the table for you? Well, I, I stayed at that school for five more years. Of course, uh, it had repercussions in my teaching. Some teachers, for instance, were were insulted that I had written about them in a certain way. Other teachers were insulted that I hadn't written about them. <laughs> you know, you cannot please everybody. Uh, in general, I think the school was was flattered that, that I had written about it. I, I began to be seen by certain kids as a kind of entrepreneur, a kind of Saul Hurek who could uh, help them realize their dreams. You know, all they had to do was con me into a project, and they could get pulled out of class and get to make their own movies or theater productions or comic books. So it was a mutual con game. You know, I was I was working with them, and they were using me as a pretext to get out of classes. This was an age and a time of experiments in education, and of yeah. course that was the reason that you were there in the first place. It was part of an educational experiment. Do you see that experimental spark in education today as well, or have things completely changed? I don't think they've completely changed, but I certainly don't see it as much. I don't think the culture is supporting it as much. Now you have to be almost more of a renegade and close the door and do it in private because uh, teaching for the test has become so important. And in a way, the, the no child left behind pressures of the Bush administration have also created more of a, a teaching for the test atmosphere. So, you know, everything is, is more pressure-filled. You know, is this going to help the kid do better on the test? And a lot of the experiments that we did were not connected to testing at all. You could make a, a kind of vague argument. This was going to uh, increase concentration, increase focus, help attendance. But in fact, you knew that it was all a bluff, you know. <laughs> you were doing it because you wanted to do it and because you thought it was good and because you knew that it engaged the kids. You just knew it would be good on some level, so you rationalized it officially however you needed to. Absolutely. And, and there were times when they tried to measure creativity and they tried to you know, have studies done of this. And I don't think any of, any of those studies uh, were conclusive or impressive. You, you either believe that uh, creativity is part of education or you don't. One of the things I found, for instance, was that a lot of times the traditional teachers were very excited about doing creative things. It wasn't just a question of the experimental open classroom teachers wanting to do it. Sometimes the experimental classes, the teachers were, were actually rather rigid, and the traditional teachers were more willing to do things. So it could never be fully predicted then? Nothing could be fully predicted. You had to come in very loose. You never knew what was going to happen. You know, you'd come in with a teaching assignment, a plan, let's say, and it would turn out that Five minutes before you got there, one kid had socked another, and all the other kids were upset. Well, it was snowing that day, and everyone was excited about that, you know? So you had to improvise a great deal. One thing I liked about teaching was this kind of uh, jazzy improvisational quality, which really did, did suit me and loosen me up. And I think in my writing as well, I try to be open to the voice in my ear, which will take me in a different direction from the one that I expected. That improvisational demand made on you by teaching, that sounds not just like a good preparation for writing, but dare I say it, it's a good preparation for life as a whole, really. Certainly for working with kids because, um, you know, they're going to take you someplace that you didn't expect. <laughs> now, this is something I was really curious about, and all of the working with kids you did, but more importantly, all of the thinking about kids and working with kids that you did while writing this up, has that, I don't know if helped is the right word, but what has that given you in regard to now having a daughter of your own? I went from being an expert to a non-expert. That's one way of putting it. <laughs> went back to amateur, huh? I think that, you know, when I, was, when I was working with kids, and I was a bachelor at the time, you know, I would say to these parents who picked up the kids, oh, your kid is so terrific, you know, I love him. You know, and they'd say, yeah, yeah, you know, you have... You have him for a few hours during the day. You know, you don't have him afterwards. <laughs> um, so they were saying, you know, you're romanticizing kids. You know, you don't quite get it. You know? It's easy to love kids and, and you know, uh, to be over the moon about them in, in very prescribed time periods, you know. Now that I have a daughter who, you know, who 
I adore completely, but who can be a pain in the neck sometimes, <laughs> uh, like any teenager. It's very different. It's, it's, any parent will tell you that you are basically, your whole life changes. A certain freedom goes out of it, and with it, you know, goes this terrific connection. You know, you can never put it aside. It's not like when you're teaching and then you go home and go to a movie or something like that. You can't just drop your kid off, you know. Your kid is with you or your children are with you. You learn that someone is more important than you. The hierarchy in your mind kind of switches all around, huh? Definitely. I wanted to go back to this issue. You mentioned finishing up your teaching experience, then reflecting on it. And when people write about their own lives, when their own lives are there, material for their writing, right. there's often a fear about imposing a narrative on the messiness of life and some, what seems like randomness. Do you worry about that, that you're ever imposing a narrative when none necessarily belongs there? It belongs because all of art is a shaping. So I want to find the, the inner shape and experience. You're saying, am I, am I imposing something? But I'm saying, I actually do believe in a mystical way that experience has a kind of inner shape. And that partly, um, I'm not so much imposing as finding that inner shape afterwards. So it's not a matter of placing anything of your own onto an experience, but a matter of looking inside the experience for what you know is there. Yes, you know, Louis Kahn, the architect, talked about letting the stone speak to him, you know. What does it want, you know. Potters often talk about finding the shape in the pot, you know. So it's not like it's all imposing it, some of it is just working with the material and finding out what it wants to be. Do you believe that in whatever experience you pick out, there's always going to be something there if you look hard enough? Or do you think that there's only a certain subset of experiences in which you will find something to bring out artistically? The, the, the second, that is, lots of experiences that I go through are of no use to me as a writer. <laughs> it just, you know, I mean, I would say 90%. Um, they have no use. And then sometimes um, I'll go through an experience and write about it, and then repeated experiences will again be no use because I've already used it. So, for instance, I, I wrote about dinner parties in this essay against Joie de Vivre. And every time I'm invited to a dinner party, people say, oh, you know, we're going to be nervous. And I say, no, you have no reason to be nervous. I've already written about dinner parties. <laughs> I don't have to pay attention to them anymore. <laughs> yeah, you're not, you're not going to write up whatever you dislike about the form of dinner parties anymore, because you've done it. I've done it, exactly. Every writer is very specific in that some material will speak to them and lots of other material will not. And there are things that I care passionately about that I've never really written about. For instance, I'm a baseball fan, but I haven't found a way to, to do that in, in, in an illuminating manner so that I'm not just being a fan. And there have been a lot of writers who have chosen to write as well about baseball because they love it. And are you, are you looking for a new angle that hasn't been done before as far as baseball? Yeah, you know, there, there are certain subjects such as baseball or one's children that inspire an overly fond subjective response, which may not <laughs> carry to the reader. It may seem self-indulgent. I think that New York might also be one of those subjects, but you have written about New York. Oh, I've written a lot about New York, and I've also edited an anthology called Writing New York, which is all about New York literature, and New York is always a character in my, in my writing. One of the reasons why I continue to write about it is because I think it's infinite, and so you can never come to the end of it. Yeah, the New York is a, is a bottomless well of material for you if you need it there. I'm essentially an urban writer. You asked me what I, how I would define myself, and I said that I'm probably more an essayist than anything else at bottom. I also think I'm, I'm a totally urban creature. I like city life. I'm not apologetic about that. I defend it. I wish this country had an urban policy. You know, I think that um, cities have a lot um, uh, to be thankful for. So even though I'm writing about New York, I'm really writing about city life. I, I respond, I feel very comfortable in cities that have millions of people in them, you know. So, so I've been to Cairo, actually, and I've been to Tokyo, and I immediately felt at ease there. You know, my idea of a relaxing place is not to go, you know, to the beach, but to go to a city of 8 million or more. I can totally understand that. And you're a New Yorker, but you're not a New Yorker who turns down all cities, but New York, you just enjoy large cities. I, d I do enjoy cities. Um, for instance, I love Buenos Aires or Rome, you know. 
and my wife says that I love New York so much because I I, I leave it often, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I go on, you know, reading tours or things like that or various teaching gigs. And so I always appreciate it. I guess if I was stuck here all the time, I would, I would not be so enamored of it. And now is this urban quality that you have, is that where your interest in architecture springs from? I think so. I, I was always interested in the built environment, but I didn't think of it so consciously, you know. Curiously enough, I, when I moved to Houston for several years, I was teaching at the University of Houston, maybe because I wasn't in New York City and because it was a very strong architectural community there. Architecture is one of the main arts of Houston. I got to hang out with architects and architectural historians and scholars, and I got to see the problems of public space, for instance, of, of buildings in relationship to each other in a much darker way, which I then brought back to New York and applied. It seems like I, I think of a New Yorker going to Houston, relocating there, and if I were a, a New Yorker going to Houston, I would think that I would try not to think about it, because, you know, I meet New Yorkers all the time who say they, they dislike cities, especially in that region, but you found something to learn there. Absolutely, and actually I liked Houston quite a lot. I didn't go down there like the archetypal New Yorker saying, you call this a bagel, you know, I didn't go down there <laughs> expecting New York. I went looking for something else. Of course, I found a lot of simpatico and intelligent people. You know, I went down there thinking everyone was going to have a gun rack, you know, or cowboy boots. And, you know, it's a very sophisticated city, so that isn't what I found. It was a driving city, and that was a, learn, a learning experience for me, just as Los Angeles uh, would be. You know, I see that there are, there are these aspects to city life that, that cut across everywhere. And so I made friends there, and, and, and ultimately, that's what you value in a city is the people. That's essentially what it comes down to if you're going to be there for the, the long, or a long stretch anyway. Exactly. I wanted to talk about one other of your influences, and of course that's, that's film. And talk a little bit about your introduction into the world of film. I was um, crazy about movies as a kid. My parents sent us off to the movies on Saturday to get us out of the house. When I was a teenager, I started falling in love with the art of film, let's say and trying to see as many of the great movies as I could, or the historically important movies. I think that it connected to my love of cities, because I was intrigued with the idea of the, the background of movies, the people being linked to an environment, you know? That was a, that was a very powerful notion to me. I, I loved Antonioni movies, and the characters would leave the frame, and the camera would stay there showing the the world, you know, or Ozu movies where he'd show rooms after they were depopulated. So the idea that, that we were in a physical and material world that would be there after we died was a strangely consoling notion to me. I like the idea of, you know, objects, backgrounds, landscapes, and so on, or the way that, that some directors would, would move the camera in space. You know, there'd be tracking shots, there'd be crane shots, and all of that, all of that tended to make me euphoric. That there was this continuity of space. Uh, it was very exciting. And you became a film lover in an era when, and this is, I think, the early 60s we're talking about, yes. where it was not as easy as it is today. You couldn't get on Netflix and you couldn't just get a bunch of movies delivered to your home. You were... You were going out to every theater you could, it sounded like, and trying to catch all of the uh, revivals of the films that you had Not missed. Not just theaters. I would go to these church basements where <laughs> somebody would have a 60-millimeter projector and a little film club, you know, college um, auditoriums, and anywhere I could see these films. That was part of the hunt. In fact, when I, when I went to foreign countries, I would buy the magazine that had all the uh, listings of the movies, and then I would discover... The neighborhoods of, uh, of a place like Tangier, let's say, or Casablanca, by um, tracking down a movie that I wanted to see. <laughs> wow. So it all comes together, the movie love and the city love, you see. I never thought about that, but yeah, that must have, that's a kind of a perfect confluence for you right there. Yeah, yeah. So movies, movies have remained a love of mine. That is, a lot of people who I knew when I was younger have graduated to other arts. You know, they've gone on to opera or ballet or something like that, or symphonies. 
but I remain an adolescent in my love for movies. <laughs> I, do you put much stock into that idea of this this hierarchy of arts, where ballet and such is something that you graduate to from films, or is that no? I was being a little ironic. Okay, I, mean, I do. You know, I think movies are a great art. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of your favorite directors because there's a certain overlap with my favorite directors, and the the, the prime suspect there would be Abbas Kiarostami, yes, who you interviewed. In it's in your book, totally tenderly tragically, and I wanted to ask what drew you to his films initially. There were several things that drew me to his films. One of them, in a word, was the humanity. It's the same kind of thing that drew me to the neorealists, you know or to such judge it ray, but this sense of um, uh, a tenderness for, for people, you know, especially people, you know, in confusion or trouble. And then there was this, um, this way that he divided up space, a kind of um, long shot aesthetic, you know, where the camera was back, and often there were very long, continuous shots. So he would embed people in their environment. And I like that. So essentially, I felt drawn to the humanistic side and the formalistic side of Kiarostami. And a, a further thing is that, you know, we were, uh, you know, for a while uh, completely antagonistic to Iran. And so this gave me an opportunity to see the Iranians as normal people, not, not through the propaganda of the American government. One of my favorite quotes from your interview with him is when he says, he'll come to America and he'll see the news here about Iran and he'll yeah. think, do I really live in that place? I know, I know. It's so, it's so um, um, shaped and stylized, you know. The Iranians, you know, we're always sort of uh, chanting and saying, you know, death to the great Satan and all that. And, you know, obviously Iran is a country with a very old, complex culture, you know, very cosmopolitan in its way. And since I'm a fellow lover of Kiarostami's films, I wanted to ask how much success you have had introducing his films to friends, because I haven't had a whole lot. Some friends really latch on to it, others are, are lukewarm. Do you ever try to spread the word about his movies? Yes, and in fact, uh, it's funny because I remember telling people to see this movie, you know, Through the Olive Trees. Yeah. And six months later, this friend of mine said to me, um, where is that playing? I, I, I'd like to see that now, you know. Of course, I had to laugh because a movie like Through the Olive Trees is in town for two weeks at most, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's not going to hang around the theaters for six months. So you either grab it or you don't, you know? But that is a, uh, an opportunity that Netflix gives us and DVDs give us because now we can see some of his earlier movies like Close Up that are so brilliant, you know? Exactly. Now, if a listener was to hear this and think, you know, i got to check this guy, Abbas Kiarostami, out, what film would you have them start with? I might have them start with Close Up. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that too, actually. But then, then go on to see where, Where's My Friend's House and um, uh, Life and Nothing Else and Through the Olive Trees. Um, everything, in fact. I wanted to get your thoughts also on another filmmaker, one that I... I've, oh, I've seen less of his films. He's lesser known, but it's Kenji Mizuguchi. Right. And what draws you to his? I'll just give you the same question. What I love about Mizuguchi, and it's something that I really look for in, in art in general, is a quality of wisdom. That is, a maturity. A sense that the artist understands the fallibility of people. And as I said in my piece in Mizuguchi, it's as though he had, he had already died and was looking back for the other shore uh, on the... Um, mistakes that mortals make without getting outraged about it, just understanding that this is, this is what people are like. So that quality of wisdom, which I also find in Chekhov, is something that I love in Mizuguchi. That combined again with an extraordinary visual sense because Mizuguchi was able to access the compositional elegance of Japanese painting, Japanese screens, Japanese woodcuts, and bring it into film. Whenever I'm watching a Mizuguchi or a Kiarostami, I think that I think to myself, this is paced just just about right for what it is, and it it's framed exactly right for what it is. Yes. And I find that often I'll watch a film released in 2007, 2008, and it'll feel like it's on fast forward. I don't know if you've had that same impression. Yes, I think that this this business of pacing and what I would call the way a film breathes that's very important. 
fact, sometimes I'll be watching a, a movie, a new release, and I'll think, I don't like the way this movie is is um, so herky jerky. I don't like the pacing of it. I don't like this, the smirkiness of it. You know, it is absolutely yes. And 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 um, it, it, it's it's a curious challenge for a film critic to put into words what is really kind of innate, which is uh, almost biological. Your breathing rhythms as they're tied to the film's breathing rhythms. So, for instance, someone like John Renoir, you know, his films breathe so wonderfully. You know, and they're not all jacked up. You know, they're not all um, hyped up. You yeah. know, there are the there are the high moments, the low moments, there are the easy moments. You know, that whole um, organic, almost biological side to movie watching, you know, was very important. And finally, it's how I discover the the filmmakers who are my kindred spirits. Critics have called 2007 one of the best years in film in a very long time. Do you agree? Yeah, I think there were some, some excellent movies. Do you what, have, did you, what did you like? Especially? Uh, well, I, did you see The Assassination of Jesse James by the Kelly Robert it. Ford? Oh, I loved it. I put it on my number two. I, my two favorite movies this year were um, No Country for Old Man and The Assassination of Jesse James. I have yet to see No Country, but I'm seeing it next week. Very good. I think it's very formally exact, and I think both those movies have a kind of um, classicism, for want of a better word. It's going to be hard to topple the assassination of Jesse James at number one on my spot, but maybe no country can do it. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to wait and find out. I really like the assassination of Jesse James. It, it felt paced right, in the same way as we were talking about earlier. Exactly. A moment, it's, it's, it's something very... The moment gets a chance to flower. The moment gets a chance to blossom. And, and, and that, that's really important. Sometimes when you're watching television, you realize that the, the camera is cutting every four seconds because <laughs> they're afraid of people's short attention spans. And no moment is allowed to flower, you know. So that's something that's very important and you know, almost a lost art. That's a good way of putting it. The moment is allowed to flower. Now, I wanted to ask you one more thing because we're running out of time, but I wanted to get to uh, the new project. Now, last I heard you were working on two novellas uh, titled Two Marriages, I believe. Is that yes. still the case? The two novellas, which are called Two Marriages, and they, they give me an opportunity to have fun and mischief in ways I can't always with personal essays. And then I wrote a book length, um, uh, a short book that I'm just finishing on Susan Sontag. The Two Marriages, is, are those novellas coming out in a single package? Yes, it's called Two Marriages. Okay. The book is called Two Marriages, and other presses bring it out in September. And the book on Sontag, is that earlier or later for a release date? Well, I just handed it in, so it's probably a year from now. As far as two marriages, I what what freedom has that project given you? You mentioned that you've been able to do some mischief there. Well, being married um, puts a certain limit on how uh, much I can write about marriage <laughs> <laughs> in the personal essay. <laughs> or I get your head handed to you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so for me to investigate certain aspects of marriage, I needed to uh, create a fictional a plot. You're, you're a little freer to work with, work yes. out of your imagination. Yes, exactly. Well, that's about all the time we have, unfortunately. So, Philip Lope, thank you so much for coming on the Marketplace of Ideas. Well, thank you, really. Our music is composed by Ben Althaus. Check out his website, Ben Althaus, that's B E N A L T H O U S E dot com. For more information, and our online show archive, visit ColinMarshallRadio.com.